Welcome everybody, come on in, there's seats over here. It is a great pleasure to welcome everyone today. Um, I'm Bob Orr, the Dean of the School of Public Policy, and it is a great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this in-person event. We're just sharing with Ambassador Negroponte that uh, while we've been doing a lot of in-person classes this fall, uh, we are just getting used to doing our events in person again. So uh, welcome and thank you. Uh, we also are, are streaming this so that there are others who are uh, with us but not with us here this morning. Um, this is a, an extremely um, great opportunity for us to welcome to the university someone who has not only served in the highest positions in the U.S. government, but in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector. Um, a, he is a, what I would call, a perfect example of our school. Um, public service, but from every different side of the equation. The government side, nonprofit side, for-profit side. Um, Ambassador Negroponte uh, is known far and wide as uh, the first director of national intelligence uh, in the United States to help create that institution, uh, weld together many pieces of the U.S. government. Um, he has also been an ambassador in uh, five countries. Well, I think yeah, we're at five with it. Well, yeah, five, five different uh, roles, uh, Honduras, um, Philippines, Mexico, Iraq, and the UN. Um, we couldn't ask for a, a better person to help us uh, look at what's happening in the world today. Um, I do want to uh, recognize that he is here as part of a collaboration that we have with McClarty and Associates. Uh, the ambassador is a principal there. Um, and uh, we are thrilled to be able to uh, welcome him as a living, breathing embodiment of that partnership. Um, uh, we do have uh, the benefit of a fellowship that the McClarty and Associates have uh, created to support uh, a student from the School of Public Policy to work on international issues um, and have an opportunity to do an internship at McClarty and Associates. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we have our first recipient here today. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will uh, uh, have an opportunity to uh, talk with the ambassador about both the, the range of issues we'll talk about today, but also uh, if there's some interest in uh, the fellowship, you can uh, pose some questions, and we're happy to talk about that as well, because this is a great opportunity to get to know that, uh, that side of uh, the equation. So with that, I will begin the conversation, and then we would like to bring you all into it as well. But um, uh, Ambassador Negroponte, um, you have served in just about every imaginable imaginable position in the U.S. government in the senior levels of the foreign affairs side. Before all of that, before you went into government and had your, your meteoric rise, can you put yourself back in the shoes of 18-year-old John Negroponte and tell me how you got involved in international affairs? What was the motivation? What brought you to this yeah. career? Indeed. Uh, thank you, first of all, Robert. Mm. Dean. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. We're, we're very proud of the fellowship and uh, look forward to having a chance to meet you after this session. I've been teaching, so I enjoy the interaction uh, with students, uh, and I've taught at several different universities, so uh, it's always a great opportunity for me. I enjoy it immensely. So, 
what, why did I? <laughs> I wanted very badly to get into the foreign service. I wanted to do that from about the age of 15. Mm. And uh, I read uh, Frank Wisner, a colleague of mine who was also sort of moved in parallel with my career. And I read his uh, oral history. And he said exactly the same thing. I mm. mean, that he wanted to do this from the uh, a very early age. In my case, the influence was uh, my parents, especially my father. They were Greek, of Greek origin, but they were very international, uh, very cosmopolitan. My father had wanted to join the Greek Foreign Service just mm. shortly before World War II, uh, and was told that he'd had his, he got his degree from the Sciences Po, mm. the Institut d'Etudes Politiques in Paris. He's probably the best, uh, I see professor. <laughs> she snuck in. <laughs> just, Susan. No way. I just finished teaching. I'm so sorry to be late. No, no, not at all. Thank you. We just started. Um, thanks for coming. Um, what's this sure. not working? It's not quite loud enough. You get, you do oh, that. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Uh, and anyway, the influence was my parents, particularly my father. He wanted to join the Greek Foreign Service. He had gotten his degree at Sciences Po in Paris, his uh, bachelor's or whatever they call it. They called it there. They called it a licence, I think. And he went to the Greek government, and they said, "If you join the Greek, want to join the Greek Foreign Service, you got to go. You got to go back to Greece and do your whole college education all over again." Well, you know. It, it, he didn't have the patience for that. And besides, it was a war looming. It was just before World War II. So, but, but that interest that he had influenced me greatly. And we talked about foreign policy and uh, those kinds of issues all the time. And uh, there were a lot of international visitors to our home in New York uh, when I was growing up. And uh, I even wrote in the eighth grade a paper on Georges Clemenceau, who was the prime minister of France during uh, at, uh, World War I. And I mentioned that at the dinner that the French ambassador uh, gave for me in New York one time. And he said, well, can we see it? <laughs> <laughs> and the only answer I could think of was, it's classified. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they're in line for the interest. So I, I, I got in as quickly as I could. I came in at the age of 21 which I think ended up being a great advantage uh, because you got to go through a lot of different uh, sort of uh, jobs, if you will, grunt work of various kinds at the beginning of these governmental careers. So I was able to get that behind me pretty fast. Well, we have a number of graduates and undergraduate students here today that I see. So I think um, uh, expressing your interest in international affairs early and often is a good part of the strategy. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, Ambassador Negroponte, you were uh, uh, central in Vietnam policy during the Vietnam War in the White House, and you spent time in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Um, in recent days, we heard a lot about that with the pullout from Afghanistan. People were drawing parallels between Vietnam and Afghanistan. I'm wondering if you could reflect on not so much the pullout from those two countries, but what kind of parallels you see in terms of the policy process across multiple administrations that led to the ultimate outcome in the Vietnam War and similarly, the policy process across multiple administrations that led to the outcome in Afghanistan. Do you see parallels there, or is that overdrawn? Uh, well, I, I think the motivation for going into those two situations, I mean, there are obviously a lot of similarities. Certainly, the way in which we withdrew from both countries, there are parallels. I think, in a way, Vietnam was a slow motion version of what mm -hmm. happened. Uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and I might say at the beginning, since we were talking about careers, uh, in 1965, I was already in Vietnam. I'd been there um, a year as a junior. It was my second tour in the Foreign mm -hmm. Service. And President uh, Lyndon Johnson decreed that every entering class of the Foreign Service, henceforth and until further notice, <laughs> would be assigned to Vietnam <laughs> for uh, mm -hmm. rural development uh, or uh, nation-building duties mm -hmm. of various kinds. So entire classes of the Foreign Service 
for a period of years uh, went there. So it, it, it influenced, it was mm. a generational experience uh, mm. for a lot of us. And it was actually so almost a common language. We all knew, mm. we knew things about Vietnam that nobody else knew. And uh, whether we'd been out in the provinces, uh, in the provincial teams, or uh, back uh, in Saigon. In terms of policy, I think they're really quite different. Uh, Vietnam was really, uh, the people who made policy in those days had grown up at the time of uh, the ascent of Hitler, the Munich Agreement, the, the fact that Neville Chamberlain rewarded mm -hmm. aggression with his, uh, uh, the Munich Agreement with uh, the Nazis. And they saw this as part of our defensive strategy in the Cold War. I think they, they believe yeah. that in very yeah. good faith. I mean, uh, we, no, nobody walked around Washington, believe me, in 19, early 1960s saying this policy is poorly mm. conceived or poorly founded. Mm. Uh, uh, there's a lot you can say about how poorly executed it was. Um, and some of the generalship was not particularly good. I've commented on that frequently about how General Westmoreland wanted to do all the fighting. He gave a briefing once to the Mission Council, that's the equivalent of the country team, it, it, at the embassy in Saigon. I happened to have been a note taker in the back. And he, exp he had these diagrams up there and everything. And it, it, it looked like the, what, what he was saying was, uh, we should uh, put American troops out in, in to in front of the North Vietnamese troops, and we should leave the Saigon forces behind to defend the villages. Well, I, I kind of scratched my head when that briefing was over and said, well, isn't that kind of a prescription for you know, being there a heck of a lot longer than we want to be? And it wasn't until Creighton Abrams came, who was his successor, and whom ironically LBJ had considered appointing instead of Westmoreland back in 64, and it might have turned out very differently, he launched this so-called Vietnamization program, but it was it was too late. We had already sapped a lot of our political will mm. for this conflict. Afghanistan, as you know, started really as a response to the 9-11 attacks. What happened there, the problem was, it kind of morphed from a, um, a counter-terrorism mission, if you will, to a counter-insurgency mission and wanting to deploy lots of people to and then you go down the slippery slope of nation building and so on and so forth. It becomes expensive and you're never very sure where to stop. Mm. So you have served five presidents, if I'm counting correctly, in uh, Senate confirmed positions. Correct. And, and a number an additional presidents in not in Senate confirmed. but. From the Carter administration, Reagan forward. administration yes. forward, you've served all the presidents. And I have to ask about bipartisanship. You have always been known as working easily with people in both parties and well. I had the pleasure of, of watching the, the transition from uh, my boss, Richard Holbrook, as UN ambassador to you becoming UN ambassador. And from a Democratic administration to a Republican, it was as collegial and professional as one could ask for on both sides. It's hard to imagine that level of collegiality and bipartisanship in our foreign policy today. Do you have hope that we can revive a bipartisan foreign policy establishment or foreign policy in the United States? Well, I'm not going to lose faith. Uh, and I think it is maybe an act of faith. But I think you have to have faith in the system. You have to have faith in the country. You have to have faith in our people. Um, and especially our young people who <laughs> are going to have this responsibility. They're going to find that they have it much sooner than they think they will. And, um, uh, you know, we've got to try to have a... I thought that uh, Harry Truman, for example, and, and, and people of his ilk, Eisenhower, uh, sure they got into nasty political fights, no question about it. I mean, winning an election in under any circumstances in the United States is not, uh, you know, 
a, a friendly, a, that friendly a sport. But, um, but I think they had a real uh, bipartisan attitude. And Roosevelt, interestingly, uh, he, he learned from Woodrow Wilson. He saw the problem that Wilson had in getting the League of Nations uh, and the Versailles Peace Treaty ratified. And he didn't want to go through that again. And so he gave uh, Senator Vandenberg, who was the, I think, Republican chair of the Foreign Relations Committee at one point, and he gave them all quite an important, uh, Edward, I think, Statinius may have been a mm -hmm. Republican as well, and he yeah. made him Secretary of State. He, he took a very bipartisan approach, and he really uh, catered to what he considered to be the strong congressional pr preferences. Example, the veto. You say, why do we have the veto in the UN Security Council? We have it because Roosevelt judged he could not get the treaty ratified unless there was provision for a veto. It, it, we, we had to have that escape clause uh, in the charter uh, for us to be willing to sign up uh, for it. You may like it, you may not, but Roosevelt judged, and he was a notorious for his pragmatism, judged that as a practical matter, he had to have the veto. Mm -hmm. So I think the old saying, politics uh, stops at the water's edge, uh, which was much more in force in those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. And I think we got to work towards it, back towards it. Now, you do encounter glimmers of this, and you do th throughout time. I mean, and particularly, and you re you'll remember this, Bob, the, the senators, uh, Republican, de Democrat, who often pair off against each other to mm -hmm. take trips mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. And so you would have uh, uh, John McCain and, and Teddy Kennedy would be <laughs> traveling together yeah. with each other. That, you know, the, the odd couples. Uh, and there were a lot of those around. And uh, uh, they would travel mm -hmm. around the world together. And uh, that was one form of bipartisanship that I think was very important. And I think especially in the Senate, I'm speaking now for of foreign affairs, because of the outsized role that the Senate has in the conduct of foreign relationships, starting, of course, with the confirmation process. Mm -hmm. Well, my favorite, um, uh, let's call it Codell to New York, was Jesse Helms and Joe Biden. There you go, the, <laughs> the Helms-Biden Amendment, uh, which Mr. Holbrook uh, was instrumental in negotiating. And I'm sure you had a big hand in it, too. And, and I think back to that time of doing the, the shuttling back and forth between Jesse Helms and his staff and Joe Biden and his staff to put together that package to pay UN arrears to the UN, US arrears to the UN in exchange for reform. At that time, it was considered kind of shocking that Jesse Helms would engage in this, that he was so anti-UN. But when engaged, um, the it worked. Uh, it it proved that it was possible. I have to like you, as an article of faith, hope that it's still possible for today's Jesse Helms and Joe Biden's to work. Well, and Jesse Helms, he changed in the in his later years yeah. and acknowledged himself that he hadn't done enough, yeah. uh, and um, uh, was a bit remorseful. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it it affected his attitude towards funding for HIV/AIDS yeah, and things like it that. Did. Uh, he was a great, it's, a, it's a, a digression, but he was a, he got some of his interest in foreign affairs by uh, uh, sort of listening to Josephus Daniels, who had been the secretary, Woodrow Wilson's secretary of the Navy and then been ambassador, he was a publisher, and he came from the same town in North Carolina, the, uh, Helms and he came from the same town. So after World War II, uh, Jesse spent quite a bit of time on yeah. Joseph Daniels' hmm. terrorists, listening to his stories. Okay. Yeah, well, it's true. Yeah. And Daniels was uh, widely considered by the Mexicans uh, the best American ambassador they ever had. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So one last question before opening it up to our students here is about one area that Republicans and Democrats are increasingly agreeing on that is China. Um, obviously, China's rise has taken place over a series of decades here. It's been fast. It has been clear and secular. But US attitudes towards engagement with China have changed fairly dramatically in recent years. To what do you ascribe the change in the US 
attitude towards China and in the U.S.-China relationship? Is this just the inevitable consequence of the rise of China? Or is it change in policy in China, change of policy in the U.S.? How do you see that relationship? Yeah, it's not an easy issue to come to grips with, I don't mm -hmm. think. But uh, I think what you describe is correct. Attitudes have hardened. And there is a, s a certain degree of consensus uh, on uh, how we must uh, toughen up our line, if you will, yeah. uh, with the country of China. For me, that's a very hard adjustment to make. Um, because I was with Dr. Kissinger on one of his early trips to Beijing. Uh, I, I went with him in June of 1972 when he, we were coming from the Moscow summit, uh, the Nixon-Brezhnev summit, to explain to the Chinese what had happened there. And so that was my first exposure. I'd served in Hong Kong as my first foreign service post, so I had a, a lot of interest in China. But for 30, 40 years, relations with China was a basically a positive-sum game. And it was a win-win, as the Chinese mm -hmm. always like to say. Mm -hmm. It was a win-win situation. And uh, we both benefited. And I don't think either of us saw any appreciable mm -hmm. downsides. And I think that really all changes uh, around the time of uh, the ascension of Xi Jinping, their president. And it was during uh, Mr. Obama's uh, administration. But it also coincided, as you indicated with this incredible rise of the country of China. When we went to China, uh, they were just dirt poor. I mean, if you left a piece of, we stayed at the government guest house when we went with Dr. Kissinger, which is still, still used for that. And if you left a blank piece of paper on your desk or in your room, the houseboy would come running out to the driveway to try to give it back to you in your limo because that piece of paper was considered to be something of great value, and he was also afraid of maybe being accused of having stolen it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how poor they were. Uh, when we established relations in 1979, I happened to have been in the East Asia Bureau under Richard yeah. Holbrook, because yeah. he was the Assistant Secretary. I was handling Southeast Asia, but I yeah. heard all the conversations. Um, and we were wondering, what are we going to buy from China? Can you imagine asking that kind of question today? I mean, they were hardly exporting anything uh, to the outside world. So incredible transformation. And they have uh, the, mm -hmm. their record of lifting, however, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty is it's a true story. Yeah. And it's an amazing story. I think we're having difficulty as Americans for two things. There's a real problem, and then there's, I think, a psychological problem. I think the real problem is they're getting stronger, and they're spending more money on their defense uh, establishment, and they're becoming a bit more muscular in their behavior, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the East Asia Pacific region. They want us out of there over the long term. And they ask me when I go still, I have talks with uh, some of my old friends there, why do you want these alliances in Asia anymore? Why do you want to have an alliance with Japan and Korea? The Cold War is over. Ha ha. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that either Japan or South Korea wants us to uh, disengage from, from their countries and, 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 and stop providing that nuclear umbrella. Um, so there's the, the reality of their growing strength. But then I think there's also the psychological adjustment for us that after having been the top dog for however long it is, 150 years, I mean, our economy surpassed that of Great Britain in about 1870. Mm -hmm. So basically, we've had the strongest economy in the world for 150 years. And, we be and World War I sort of uh, kind of cemented our role, if you will, mm -hmm. as, as the great power that we became. And so now we have a peer power. And I'm not sure we've yet figured out how to deal with that. Mm. I think it's probably got to be dealt with both with firmness on the one hand, but we've got to also try and find opportunities for collaboration and cooperation on the other. Because you can't, there, the, there's certain affairs of the world, whether it's climate uh, change or, uh, or, or pandemics, that really do, uh, will benefit or uh, can benefit from uh, collaboration. 
But if we're, uh, you know, hurling brickbats at each other, that becomes a little bit more difficult. Well, on that score, my hope is actually in the folks in this audience. I think that cultural shift of how to work with a peer power is something that is baked into all of your careers, your studies, your lives uh, in a way that it wasn't in, in either of the ambassadors. Yeah, and, and in the grand strategy seminar, which uh, before it got sort of a bum rap in the uh, New York Times a few weeks ago up at Yale, which I taught at for a number, uh, several years, probably the most fundamental reading that they do there is the Peloponnesian War. Yeah. <laughs> and the so-called Thucydides trap, and that uh, uh, Sparta feared the, the war was inevitable. The line of, of uh, Thucydides is something like, war was inevitable because Sparta feared the rising power of Athens. So you know, will that repeat itself? You have a political scientist at, at Harvard who at the JFK school uh, who thinks uh, there's a good chance that it will. Yeah. Okay, with that, I do want to turn to our students. If you could please identify yourselves and pose your question. I am going to give the first question to Jose. As the McLarty Fellow, there should be uh, various things that come with the prestige of the McLarty Fellowship. The first question to Ambassador Negroponte is one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I guess my question would be, based on the fellowship, let's go with that, it's because we need people to apply because it's a great opportunity. You can ask me questions later if you want. But <laughs> Good asking advertisement. Ambas yeah, asking Ambassador Negroponte, why do you think that students like myself and those here should apply to the fellowship mm -hmm. and come um, work at McClarty? Well, uh, well, first of all, we welcome that. And congratulations, and it's great to uh, see you and I uh, look forward to having a chance to chat. The uh, McClarty Associates is a uh, strategic consulting firm. We have offices in uh, a number of places around the world, starting with uh, Brussels, uh, Singapore, uh, New Delhi, and Beijing, in addition to Washington. Uh, we have uh, uh, advisors and uh, people from those countries who also serve on the uh, uh, on our kind of leadership council, if you will, or our advisory board. And we help uh, mostly American companies, although some uh, not not-for-profit institutions mm -hmm. as well. We have, we have had at universities and others as clients uh, in certain situations. We help them deal with uh, problems that, uh, and issues that, they, that arise in their operations abroad. That's, that's mm -hmm. the essential uh, mm -hmm. function. It, it's kind of a form, if you will, of economic or commercial diplomacy. It's, uh, it's diplomacy, but from a private sector perspective. So I think anybody interested in, in either international business or foreign service, I think would find themselves uh, very comfortable with the people who work uh, at McClarty Associates. And we have about 50 or 60 people who work in Washington, although we've been working mostly virtually in the past a uh, year and a half, uh, but we're working slowly towards getting back to working full time uh, in the office. But uh, I would say it, it's a it's a great stepping stone to an internet a career in international affairs, either public or private. And if I, I could just add one beat, I think both when you were at the representing the U.S. at the U.N. and when I was doing the same. I would say the one of the greatest strengths of the U.S. when operating at the U.N. was the diversity of the U.S. Uh, citizens that we brought to the table to, for the negotiations in different parts of the world, the language skills. <clears throat> we do hope that the McClarty Fellowship helps us to broaden the diversity of our uh, international engagement from a U.S. perspective. So it's an opportunity. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I know that, you know, our contemporary leaders would, prop, would want to say that they're uh, taking a strong leadership role in these issues, and they are. There's no question about it. But it's not, they didn't invent it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it has existed before. And Andy Young, for example, mm -hmm. was Jimmy Carter's uh, representative, mm -hmm. the mayor of Atlanta, yeah. and a wonderful gentleman, uh, African American, is still alive, a little, a little bit frail, but uh, and uh, he loves to tell the story that when he got sworn in as ambassador to the United Nations, and they were congratulating his father, who was a dentist. Uh, they were congratulating the father. He, he would keep saying to everybody in the, line, in the receiving line, he'd say, well, I think Andy would have been a terrific dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and we had Don McHenry, and we had others. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not completely new, but I think it's being intensified, and I think it's also being more systematically addressed, and I think that's good. Great. So, folks, uh, identify yourselves, and we'll get our first question. You, you moved quickest first. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Meredith. I'm a first-year policy graduate student with an interest primarily in uh, international development. Um, and I'm really curious, you've had positions in so many different distinct places with uh, foreign service and private sector and nonprofits. And I'm sort of wondering if you can speak to what um, skills or attributes you think makes it possible for someone to be successful across multiple distinct spaces, what you've done in your own career, what you've seen other people do to make that work to, to be in so many different uh, environments. Right. Um, that's a great question. If I can limit my answer to the foreign affairs side of it, in other words, because that's really been my area of concentration. I mean, I, I, I've not done that much work that's concentrated on, let's say, domestic problems and domestic issues. I do think in the area of foreign affairs and international relations, there are certain attributes that probably can serve you well uh, pretty much across the board, whether it's public, private, uh, or nonprofit, starting with uh, language and area expertise. I mean, I've always felt, for example, that people who were Peace Corps volunteers, and as you perhaps know, uh, when you're a Peace Corps volunteer, and some of you may have been Peace Corps volunteers. I'll out Meredith as a former, a return to Peace Corps oh, volunteer. Oh, there you go. Okay. There's a reason she well, asked that good bingo, question. Bingo, bingo. <laughs> but they taught you a foreign language if you went to a place that spoke, it didn't speak English. And they always do that, and that's a terrific thing. But I, I feel, in a way, Peace Corps volunteers are the ideal example because uh, they're not overpaid by any means. <laughs> uh, they don't live, you know, the kind of expatriate, you know, uh, two-bedroom apartment and allowances and all that kind of stuff. They have, they, it's, it's a little more modest. And they learn how to, and here's the part that a lot of my colleagues, including in the US military, didn't fully appreciate. They knew how to get stuff done in a foreign environment and outside of an American legal framework. I'm not trying to suggest they, they violated local laws, <laughs> but the fact is sometimes there just are no laws or there are no rules. And you got to figure out, well, how am I going to get this done in this much less well-regulated environment. You may, not, you may think America is not well enough regulated, but believe me, compared to many places, and certainly compared to where a lot of Peace Corps volunteers are going, it's plenty regulated. Mm -hmm. And the ability to get stuff done in that kind of environment can serve you extremely well in all of these different areas, whether it's public, private, or not, not for profit, because that's going to be your challenge. How am I going to achieve the objectives of my organization in your country? Mm. So I think uh, language, area exp expertise, and living abroad. Uh, I mean, we had that discussion with my counterpart in Iraq, who's a wonderful man, my, the, the commanding general. But you know, if, if the post office in Iraq wasn't working, he would say we should assign uh, postal workers from the United States. And I said, I don't think so. Uh, I think what you want is people who have a track record of getting stuff done in a foreign environment. Give me a Peace Corps volunteer to help run the post office, maybe better than, than a postal worker. Uh, and ditto with all sorts of expertise. You'd be amazed how 
little your expertise means if you can't persuade the guy <laughs> or the lady who's listening to you uh, to do what it is you recommend. Mm. So there's a little added quality that's needed there. Okay. Um, let's see. Go to this side of the room. Joshua. Um, good afternoon, Ambassador Negram Hadzi. My name is Joshua Winston. Um, I'm in Army ROTC, University of Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an undergraduate senior student. Um, and my question is, you were the first director of the Department of National Intelligence. If you could talk a little bit about the transition from being a foreign service officer to working in the intelligence field. Yeah. So uh, my transition from being a foreign service or diplomat uh, to being in intelligence. I, uh, sometimes I give a lecture called uh, Diplomacy and Intelligence Partners in National Security. Um, I think, actually, they're just slightly different sides of a similar coin. Uh, a foreign service officer, let's say a political officer like I was, uh, is basically an overt, for the beginning, the first parts of your career, you're an overt intelligence collector. You just collect it, but uh, you don't do it clandestinely. The intelligence people collect information clandestinely. But I, I was a provincial reporter in Vietnam. I spent a year and a half traveling. I had seven, I was assigned to cover six or seven South Vietnamese provinces, and I'd go out every week, collect information, meet people, write about uh, political, uh, economic, uh, security conditions. And then in those days, we didn't have all the internet and everything. I'd come back to Saigon, I'd write up my reports, get my laundry done, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Spend a week back at headquarters and then go back out again and, and, and so on and so forth. So we, we're we over intelligence collectors, just like defense, like military attaches are at United States embassies. I also worked in every single foreign service assignment I had. I worked with the intelligence community. I mean, I worked with the people involved in intelligence in that embassy or consulate or whatever. And uh, so we knew each other pretty darn well. And some of the work we did was similar. And of course, some of it was different. So I, I felt quite comfortable taking over the DNI. I did not have a fascination, a personal fascination, with uh, covert action. I knew about covert action. I'd been, <laughs> some of it had happened on my watch in a couple of different embassies that I uh, oversaw. But I was not particularly interested in trying to micromanage that aspect of uh, the intelligence community. I was particularly interested in improving um, both the quality and the reputation of our analysis, because it had just suffered a very serious blow with this WMD fiasco we had vis-a-vis -vis Iraq, and which was so painful an experience for Colin Powell, who spent, who was, uh, giving the Security Council the UN yeah. false information unwittingly. Yeah, I think he presented what he did in, in, in perfectly good faith. So the, the focus on improving our analysis was my emphasis then. And I think, I think a foreign service officer's got a lot of experience that can be helpful in that regard. So I frankly personally didn't see it as a particularly big adjustment. And I would point out that a number of the directors of national intelligence came from the intelligence directorate, the analytic directorate, not necessarily the operational directorate. Some were from the operational directorate, but not all. Uh, Bob Gates, notably, was an, a, a Soviet analyst. That's what got him well, where, that's what helped him get where he got. And uh, there were several others uh, as well. So. There are, lot, there are a lot of similarities and some differences. I, the, thing, the reason I never particularly wanted to become a CIA officer myself was I, I didn't like not being able to say what I was doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that was the part that I, I, I'd rather talk about what I do <laughs> if I can. <laughs> Makes life a lot easier. Um, here. Okay. Oh. Oh, we'll, we'll get you. We'll get right behind you, right after that. Okay. 
Ambassador, uh, welcome to the university. Thank um, you. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, as I think we all appreciate you coming out, and it's it's certainly very special to have you here today. So thank you very much. Um, I think there's a lot of different experiences that folks might have in some of these different areas. Can you talk just a little bit generally about for someone who would be interested in going into some of these spaces in international affairs and foreign foreign policy, just some things to think about for down the road. I think there's a lot up in the air, some things are changing. Um, maybe some of the interactions between different countries and nation states are different than they have been before. What are some things to keep in mind about what might be different down the road uh, for someone that's maybe thinking about going know. into these areas? Not sure I heard absolutely. Uh, and my hey. name's Catherine Kletzer. Yeah. So I think Catherine was asking about what changes do you anticipate in terms of how countries are interacting with each other for this generation going out into a, an international career. It may be different countries, different ways of interacting with each other. What are the, the things to look for? Keep in mind for the Greeks. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think some things may not change that much because I think geopolitics, uh, there's a certain set nature to certain aspects of geopolitics. I mean, wh where your country is situated, it's always going to make a difference, isn't it? Uh, uh, and particularly if you're a smaller uh, country. Uh, so I, you know, I don't see too much change in that regard. Nor do I see any major change in trying to learn as much as you can about these cultures and their languages. Don't forget, you're the if you're in the foreign service. By the way, whichever foreign service, Su Susan Schwab was director general of the commercial, the foreign commercial service. But whatever foreign service you're in, one of your principal responsibility is to know the situation on the ground. No one else, I mean, your bosses in Washington can't be expected to know them in the level of the de detail that you do. And that still is invaluable information for people back here in this town. And I think, actually, it might become more important uh, in future years as the uh, international environment becomes more competitive for the United States. We, we probably could get away with more mistakes when we were the quote unquote sole remaining superpower than we'll be able to do uh, in this new emerging globally competitive situation. I think the margin for error is going to be reduced. And I think that's going to demand higher levels of performance by our people that we have working abroad. I mean, think about it. Some of you have read, I'm sure, and when you read about strategy, you've read Sun Tzu, the Chinese uh, philosopher of war. And you know, he speaks very cryptically. I mean, he managed to cram everything he knew into whatever it was, 70 or 80 pages, but it's, it's pretty good stuff. And of course, one of his dictums is know the terrain. I mean, he talk, he's talking about intelligence and he's talking about fighting war, but I think it applies just as much to uh, international relations. I'm not sure I've really answered your question, but I think I, oh, I've addressed part of it. We have time for one more, and you've been very patient. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, I realize I actually heard you speak at the International Students' House a few uh, years ago, so oh, okay. Uh, I thought I rang a bell. Um, I'm a bit more of a, a substantive uh, question. So, you served as direct, uh, director of national intelligence, and I'm curious as to uh, your perception with regard to who will emerge as the United States' most reliable and consistent partners in the area of intelligence as we seek to restore trust with our allies abroad. And on the flip side of that. Um, out of Russia or China or other actors potentially who possesses the greatest threat to our national security specifically with regard to intelligence? Yeah. Um, I think the honest answer to your first question is that while we have uh, cooperative arrangements like with the Five Eyes and you know, almost like Winston Churchill's English-speaking peoples, right? I mean, it's Canada, it's <laughs> UK, Australia, New Zealand. Um, I think that most intelligence officers you talk to probably feel reasonably confident that we can do most of this stuff ourselves. 
Uh, I'm not saying we're, you know, that the unilateralism is inbred or anything like that, but I mean, we do have uh, pretty global capabilities and, and, and they're, and we've invested levels of uh, funding in our capabilities that just far outstrip what anybody else does. I mean, rule of thumb, without divulging any uh, real uh, national secrets or anything, we, we spend about 10% of our Defense Department budget on intelligence. Well, that's a lot of money for just intelligence. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of capability there. We have some very cooperative arrangements with some countries. And I, I think I was always the most struck by some of the cooperation we have with Australia, uh, including out in Alice Springs in the, you know, where, where it used to be, you know, the NSA. At those days, you had to call them no such agency. But, uh, <laughs> uh, that, but I think that's now been more or less acknowledged, and so they take you to this incredible place. I went there as a DNI, a, 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 a signals intelligence facility that is just extraordinary, out in the middle of, you know, Australian desert. They've got camels. They, they imported camels there 100 years ago. They're still walking around, and you can hear the dinko dogs in the middle of the night when you go to sleep because it's very quiet, and you can... They show you the star. They, they give you <laughs> displays of the <laughs> astronomy and everything else because the air is so clear. But I'd say, yeah, Al the Australians have been really incredible partners and, and played an indispensable role in, in certain situations. Uh, as far as adversaries, uh, yeah, stay tuned. I think you've got to watch out for the ones you mentioned, uh, Russia, China, uh, you know, you've got Iran and North Korea that are problematic. And, and, you know, you do have to worry about a leader like in North Korea who goes around, you know, with s launching uh, missiles from submarines. I mean, it, it's a bit, it makes you wonder, right? And, you know, how are we going to deal with that? I'd love to see us one day reach a sufficient level of meeting of the minds with the Russians and the Chinese to find a way of curbing that behavior uh, by the North Koreans. Um, I, <laughs> I don't think they have an interest in people uh, navigating near their coasts with uh, submarines and loose nukes either. So um, we'll have to see how that goes. So maybe just to, to wrap up, um, uh, do you have any final thoughts for the students about, you know, that maybe that questions that didn't come up. Any thoughts for them about... Uh... Well, just, yeah, here's uh, would be my sort of parting shot, really. And that is, I, diplomacy is still relevant. Sometimes people say, oh, you're just a messenger boy. And you just, and, and besides Washington, they can communicate with those people, too. A smart leader in the U.S. will use their ambassadors they may want to use others also to communicate with governments, but they should use their ambassadors, number one. Uh, and, and number two, uh, I think embassies uh, abroad uh, can make a very valuable uh, contribution to Washington's understanding and knowledge of local situations. You can't learn everything through the internet or through, uh, you know, gathering information from here in Washington. Uh, a local presence is important and uh, um, I, I think still uh, an important thing for our diplomacy and our national security to have. So I don't think that diplomacy is going to become irrelevant anytime uh, soon. And uh, if only for that reason, I think uh, it remains a very, very interesting uh, profession to pursue. So for those of you who want to pursue it, you've got a living, breathing example that it can be an exciting career. Um, and we appreciate you coming out and showing interest today. Uh, go ahead and grab Jose and ask about his experience. Uh, this is one, one way we have to uh, really get on a, a fast track into an international career that we will most certainly need you all. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.